if we start with a balance, uh, FY17, a 16 balance of 52.8 billion in the permanent fund, and if you'd earned the 6.95% and subtracted dividends, you'd have come out with about $55 billion balance. Instead, our balance is $59 billion. So there's $4 billion more in the permanent fund than we had projected there would be in last year's model. Now, 6.5% earnings on that extra $4 billion is about $270 million in, in earnings from a balance that we didn't realize would be there. So the decline in earnings is not 300, it's 300 offset by 270 in additional earnings. So the net loss there is, is about $30 million a year. And it's slightly more complicated than that because the, the lower earnings will affect the balance in, in the long run. But the model isn't based on what the permanent fund earns for, to pay government. It's based on a fixed five and a quarter or five percent payout. Well, the five percent payout is based on the balance, not future earnings. So the $4 billion extra gives us higher payouts in this version of the model than we had last year. Does that make sense? So um, what we wind up with is, is something that looks like it's a, it's a bad thing deal here. I mean, clearly, revenue is down slightly. That doesn't help. Expenditures are up. That doesn't help try to find a solution. And then permanent fund earnings are down. Again, doesn't help you find a solution. But revenue is essentially a, a wash and is slightly more than offset by the increase in permanent fund payout to government. So really what you're trying to do here is, is cover the additional expenditures. That's the, the fiscal situation has deteriorated, but not by as much as you might think by looking at these, uh, all three of your major drivers in the model went the wrong way. The model output's still about the same. Um, in slide five, we actually turn to the sc a screenshot from the model. I know this is hard to read, but um, this is the no POMV payout. You could also call it the status quo or the, the no plan scenario if you want, but it, this is what it looks like going forward if we do not use the earnings reserve account to pay government. You can see that there's very little change from the model last year. We said the CBR, Constitutional Budget Reserve, would de be depleted in 19. That's still the case. Here you have continued deficits of 2.4 to 2.8 and going up even into the $3 billion range. And number three, those huge deficits mean that if you're going to continue spending the money and there's no CBR available, you draw the money from the earnings reserve account. You can see that in the upper left quadrant, the red bars, or you can see it in the lower left where we show you the amount of those unplanned draws, and they are, you know, touching three billion dollars. You can see that because you have these unplanned draws, the earnings reserve account is depleted or depleting by 27. You probably have a year left before that is also depleted. And of course, because you have unplanned draws, the value of the permanent fund declines. 
And this is not simply a matter of failing to keep up with inflation. Note that there is an actual decrease in the value of the permanent fund. Now, of course, that occurs strictly in the earnings reserve account. The principal cannot go down, but this graph is showing the combined principal and earnings reserve account. The earnings reserve account is declining, and therefore the total of them declines. Mr. Teal, if we could pause there for a moment. Um, the corpus of the permanent fund is invested, so uh, it can go up or down. Is that accurate? It, you, you just stated that it could not go down. Uh, the legislature cannot touch the corpus, but the corpus is invested in a variety of assets around the world and in a, in a variety of ways, real estate, stocks and bonds, other assets. Th th those assets fluctuate just like the earnings reserve. It's just that the legislature or government has, does not touch that money at all, but it can, it can move in an up or down way as the corpus. Um, Madam Chair, that's correct, and it, it's, I would go further in describing it. Any investment is subject to loss. The, the principal and the earnings reserve are co-invested, same portfolio. They essentially, uh, from for an investment standpoint, they're the same. However, any losses that occur accumulate in the earnings reserve account. Any gains also accumulate in the earnings reserve account. That's why uh, we often say that you should not confuse a budget reserve account with this earnings reserve account because the budget reserve account, the only way you're going to lose money there in significant amounts is to spend it. If you lose 10% on your investments, you may lose 10% of your total, say it's $2 billion, you're going to lose $200 million. But all earnings and losses of the permanent fund concentrate in the earnings reserve account. And so the, if you have a 10% loss in the permanent fund, it's, it's, it's not just a $15 billion earnings reserve account falls, to, falls by 1.5 million. It is you lost $6 billion, all of which reduce the balance of the earnings reserve account. So that's the danger of considering the earnings reserve account as a budget reserve account. It can go away very quickly as it did in 2008 and 9. Senator Machiki, followed by Sen Senator Von Imhoff. Thank you, Madam Chair. We also learned uh, with a recent meeting, Senate Finance with the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation that they used to automatically repair realized losses in the corpus by drawing from the earnings reserve. They believe now that there may be a problem with that, with the court case that came that may require legislative appropriation to keep the corpus whole from a loss. So that may be further complicated with use of the earnings reserve for partially funding government. I think that's something we still need to learn some more about. Thank you, Senator Machiki. I would um, note that this is informational so that Alaskans can stay engaged on how many variables that we have on the table at any one time for conversation as we face this fiscal challenge that is before us. Um, the CBR, Mr. Mr. Teal, we haven't talked about it, but uh, we haven't talked about it today, but for those following today, the, the CBR uh, uh, has a little bit over $2 billion remaining in it. And so some Alaskans believe we can draw that $2 billion down and still may not need to touch the earnings reserve. And so can you comment on that? We've been at least told by the administration that that money is currently being used as a bridge. Now, we already knew at this table that that money is receiving a lower rate of return because of the liquidity, how we keep it available for use short term because according to Alaska state statute, it can be used within a five-year period. And so Department of Revenue uh, triggered that a few years back and li liquidated that so the rate of return on the CBR uh, is much less because of its liquidity. 
Um, but Mr. Teal, uh, there is a recommendation out of your shop as well as out of OMB that has indicated we need at least $2 billion as a bridge uh, because Alaskans should know that all money doesn't come into the state on January 1st or on July 1st at the start of our budget. And so uh, uh, there is a need for uh, cash on a uh, more even basis than we receive, whether it's production that's coming in, whether it's the tourism industry and receipts. They just don't all show up the day we start our budget. Mr. Teal, could you comment on the CBR so that Alaskans understand that even though you're mathematically showing it going away, there is a need to keep an amount of money uh, in the CBR to maintain uh, consistency of payments from the state of Alaska. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, what you said uh, is, is accurate. I think it's, you should also be aware that um, although there is what they call cash flow needs, it, the CBR, Constitutional Budget Reserve Account, is not the only source for that. Um, you could use the earnings reserve account for cash flow needs, but remember, when you do that, you're pulling cash out of an account earning 6.5% instead of 25 to 3%. So you want to get money where it's cheapest. Um, but there's another source of money, which is what most states do. They issue revenue anticipation notes, which are just short-term notes borrowing the money in, in the market, uh, which is probably uh, available to you at 3% or, or less. And that can cover the cash flow needs as well. That said, I agree with OMB that a that billion dollars is, is as low as you want to go. Um, Two billion dollars is, is a reasonable amount to, to say we're just not going below $2 billion in the in the CBR. Personally, if, if you're asking that, I'd prefer $5 billion. But how much you need is, is a personal thing based on, on what you believe our chances of having a revenue failure are. Understand that the budget reserve account is not really designed to be a constant source of revenue like we've used it in the past years. It's designed to be a shock absorber when we have a revenue failure. And, and revenue failure to me just means, for us, oil revenue didn't show up the way we expected it to. Okay, when that happens, you need reserves. Theoretically, you're only using uh, the reserves that you need to fill the gap, and within a short time, you've fixed your fiscal gap and you again replenish your constitutional budget reserve. For the last six years, we have not used it that way. There is no replenishment, not that happened and not that's in sight. So we're not using the CBR as a shock absorber. We're using it as a deficit filler with, with no hope of bouncing back. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I think that uh, that is an important point um, that the general public should realize, and the problem is that we're also under the, the scenario